Thank you, choir. I greatly appreciate. This morning, I cannot pretend to be your pastor. Your pastor is a great man, a great, a great man, and I greatly appreciate him. I will not an attempt or pretend to have the skills that he has. But this morning, I want to share with you briefly uh, in a way that's a little bit, that's a departure, not a little bit, from what you are used to. I'm going to be looking at three different passages, um, mainly to Mark uh, 15 and Leviticus 21. But I'm going to marinate these two passages with Psalm that we just read, Psalm 31. As you all well know, in the days of slavery, our forefathers, my cousins, my aunts, and so on, uh, lived in brutal, under brutal conditions. During those days of agony and seemingless hope they committed themselves to the one and the only one who can give us victory. And so they composed some of the very deeply moving songs with haunting melodies, rich with emotions. This we refer to today as spirituals. These spirituals were songs of hope and anticipation. They were the sole cry of the slave longing for freedom. They embraced Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And in the, midst of all, in the midst of almost unbearable suffering, they experienced his grace, peace, and hope for the future. From this relationship, they were able to sing, were you there? Were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I'm so sorry. In Mark 15, where we just read, we see the background to the extraordinary claim of the New Testament that the one they crucified is in fact my Lord. God is described in the Old Testament as the Lord. And the original word for Lord, the Hebrews wrote only letters. It's a Y-W-H. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> but that was the divinity, the, the magnitude of reverence they gave to the name of the Lord. And uh, it had no, no vowels, so there was no way of pronouncing it and was not, voc in fact, it was not vocalized. It was considered too sacred to pronounce. For that reason, when vowels were added to the original Hebrew text, they weren't added to the name, what we now call Yahweh. There has been much debate in modern times as to vowels should go should be used. It is used to be it used to be thought it should be Jehovah, but most scholars now think Yahweh is much more accurate. And then in the in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Septuag that is the Septuagint, the sacred name, Yahweh, is translated Kairos, or Lord. It really is quite extraordinary, therefore, that the New Testament writers, who were Jewish uh, uh, monotonists themselves, made this fundamental Christian affirmation that Jesus is Lord. Romans 10, 9, and, uh, and uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 5, Acts 2, 36, and that our Lord 
has been crucified for us. Psalm 31, love the Lord. Love the Lord. David urges us, love the Lord, all his faithful people. In verse 23, to love the Lord is the first commandment. This is a two-way relationship of love. We love him because what? Because he first loved us. Oh, how I love that. I couldn't have loved the Lord had he not shown me love. I wouldn't have known what love is had I not experienced the love from him first. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. Our love is a response to his love. Again, David writes, Praise be to the Lord, for he showed his wonderful love to me. Verse 21a. So we meditate on how much God loves me, how much God loves you. What a stack of blessing you have piled up for those who worship you. As message put it in verse 19, what a stack of blessings you have piled up for those who worship you. Many times we don't realize the blessings that we have as Christians. Many, many years ago, I was, we were counseling with a couple and uh, the husband began to observe. His wife is an attorney in one of the states nearby. He said, you know, since my wife had become um, uh, managing the uh, state attorney's office and all kinds of nemesis that come up. He said, you know, when we are Christians, we forget that these nemesis do exist or has continued to exist. But when we see them face to face, we realize how much God has blessed us by saving us uh, and making us his children. So we are free from that. We don't think of such nemesis. And many times we don't even confront them because he continues to shield us with such a great fence that nothing comes to meet with us. So what are some of these piles of blessings that the Lord has uh, given to those who, uh, who love him? Number one, he hides you in the shelter of his presence. Verse 20, we're looking at Psalm 31. Number two, he keeps you safe in his dwelling. Again, verse 20, B. He protects you from accusing tongues. He hears your cry for mercy when you call for his help. God takes care of all who stay close to him, verse 23. Therefore, therefore, you can be strong and take heart, verse 24a, even when things are seemingly difficult. You can therefore be brave. You can therefore be strong and you won't give up. You won't give up. Verse 24 again. Number two, Jesus is Lord. Mark 15, again, 1 through 31. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I find it heart wrenching, rendering, heart wrenching to read the account of the abuse, torture, and crucifixion of Jesus. As a young person, I was told the story of the crucifixion and many other Bible stories over and over again. But to understand the gravity of what Jesus Christ went through to purchase my salvation was, you know, it was just a, it was just a story until I began to grow older. And I tell you, I'm one of those that hate pain. Um, if, you, if you put the word pain and maybe you take, take out the letters A-I, A-I and just say P-N, my body will begin to, to vibrate because I know what is in between. <laughs> and yet, this man Jesus went through such excruciating pain 
endured such excruciating pain in order to secure my salvation. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? They crucified my friend and my Lord. Last Wednesday, Brother Larry was sharing with us and I appreciate the depth of his, uh, his depth and compassion for his Lord. He would, he would address him, my Lord. They did this to my Lord. And when he says that, you can almost feel it. They crucified my friend. They crucified my Lord. Jesus claims and is my king. Jesus accepts the title of king of the Jews in verse 2. The soldiers used it as a term of abuse in verse 18, and it is the name written on the cross as the charge against him in verse 26. However, Jesus is the fulfillment of the great longing of Israel and the many promises of Davidic kingdom, of the Davidic king, as you can see in Isaiah chapter 9 and chapter, two, uh, chapter 11. He is a king with a difference. He is my king. I don't know about you. He is handed over to Pilate, Pilate out of envy, sheer spite by the religious leaders. He was coming and taking the shine of them. He didn't, need to, he didn't need to go on the television. He didn't need to go on YouTube. He didn't need to go on Facebook. He didn't need to do use Twitter. Like when he, was, when he would be sleeping at 3 a.m. in the morning, he had to tweet so that then when you wake up, you see. No. He was the king extraordinary. And he didn't need any of those helps to make him shine. Jesus was my king and is my king with a difference. So be careful of envy. It is sometimes described as the religious sin. Envy is dangerous. Jesus is subject or was subject to insults and accusations. If you are slandered or bad-mouthed, be thankful that God allows you in a tiny way to enter into the sufferings of Jesus and pray that God will help you to respond as he did with love and forgiveness. Jesus is my, is my Messiah. It is ironic that the religious leaders mocked him and described him as this Christ. This Christ. Can you hear it? Can you hear the spite in that in that remark, this Jesus, verses 31 and 32, because that is exactly what he was and is. He is, now listen to the difference, he is the Christ. He is my Christ. He is my, my, my Messiah, and he is my Savior, no matter what religiosity may paint him to be. He is the Christ. Because that is indeed exactly what he is, that's indeed what he was, and that's indeed what he continues to be. The English term Christ is derived from the Greek Christos, which translates the Hebrew Messiah or Messiah. Both the Greek and the Hebrew literally means anointed. We have seen Jesus as the anointed high priest of God. Here, we see him as the anointed king as well. This Jesus is my savior. Again, we see the extraordinary irony of the mocking words, both of the passerbys. Then they said, I said to him, come down from the cross and save yourself and save us too. While you are it, save us too, right? And the religious leaders, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Yeah. You know, the jeering, mocking that, they went, that went on, then they, they were really rejoicing. This was exactly true. But you know, 
I, I have to find the name, I have to find the name of the guy that did this beautiful ren rendering of uh, poetry, sermon. He says, on Good Friday, it is Friday, but Sunday is a coming. They rejoiced. They mocked him. They brought out, they rolled out the drums Friday evening and they danced and, and, and danced and jumped all over the place mocking Jesus, but they didn't know that Sunday was coming. This was exactly true. In order to, to be the savior of the world, he could not save himself. In order to be the savior of the world, he could not save himself. Why? If he saved himself, then he wouldn't be the savior of the world. In order to be the savior of the world, he could not save himself. He had to go through the agony of the crucifixion in order to save you and me. The incident with Barabbas provides us with a picture of what Jesus had, had done as savior of the world. Barabbas, like me, and believe it, like me, was guilty and deserved punishment. He was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising, verse 7. Jesus, on the other hand, was totally innocent, as Pilate, as Pilate remarked. What crime has he committed in verse 14? Yet Barabbas was released and set free whilst Jesus was handed over to be crucified. The innocent one faced the punishment of death so that I, the guilty one, could go free. We may not be murderers like Barabbas, but all of us need rescuing by the Savior of the world. This Jesus is my Lord. In Mark 14, we saw how when Jesus was asked by the high priest, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Do you see the reasoning the high priest, of course, was a religious expert. He knew the scripture. So he was asking accurate question. Are you? But the intent of his question was not to solicit the right answer. He said, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? He answered, I am. Where did that come from? Exodus chapter 3. Who said that? Who said so? God himself. And can you imagine what the building would have sounded like when he said that word in the presence of the highest religious experts and authorities? I am. John, uh, Mark 14, 60, 61 and 62. The high priest's response was to accuse Jesus of blasphemy. That he is claiming to be God. Why was this? When God revealed his name as Yahweh to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, which we have already said, he also explained its meaning. It comes from the Hebrew phrase, I am who I am, or simply, I am. The high priest's response to Jesus' statement suggests that Jesus was de 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 declaring himself to be none other than Yahweh, the Lord. Jesus is my Lord. This amazing truth is the background behind St. Paul's extraordinary soul cry in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, which forms the basis of the prayer that follows. Lord, Help me to have the same attitude as Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient to death. Thank you that you exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every, thong, every tongue acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. 
He is my Lord. So worship the Lord. As we go to Levit Leviticus chapter 21 and some part of 22. Never mind, I'm not going to go through all of it. But this is our third point. Worship the Lord. There is a great emphasis in this passage on the holy name, especially when you look at verse 2, holy name of God. In chapter 22, God says to his people, I am the Lord. Nine times, I am the Lord. As if they needed, they needed to take something and remove the words from their ears and hear and assimilate and leave it out. I am the Lord. One time. See, when I was a kid, when my father would call me three times, the third one, he would put all my names. And when he does that, what is he saying? Are you hearing me? You better hear me. But in this case, nine times, God was saying to his people, I am the Lord, nine times. Why does God emphasize his name in these verses? Names were very significant in the ancient times. And believe it, from our heritage, names are very, very significant. You know, you know me as Stan or Stanley Okoro, period. There are, there are many rivers in between those two. And I won't bore you with them. But every one of them has significant meaning. For the time I was born, the circumstances that my family was facing when I was born, the state of mind of my mother as she brought me out, all of that were incorporated in the various names that I was given. Very names are very, very meaningful. They were believed to tell you something important about the person in question. As we have seen, God's name was no exception. The name Yahweh declared the uniqueness and greatness of God. God's name reminded his people of his unique relationship with them. It was a name that had been revealed to Moses as a sign of God's promise to be with his people in Exodus chapter 3. God's names are very significant. Each time God declares, I am the Lord, he reminds the people both of his greatness and of their relationship with him. Each of the laws in, the, in this chapter also is built upon these truths, and it is designed to point them towards, to, to, to designed to point them towards these laws and towards, towards God and his name. The theme of Exodus chapter 21 is God's holiness and the need for the priesthood, the needs of the priesthood for the people to be able to approach God. They have to be holy themselves. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus Christ is the great high priest, and it is through him that we approach God. This Jesus, this Jesus is completely holy. The high priest had to be ceremonially clean. Verse 20, verse 11 of 21. Jesus was morally perfect. Jesus is completely holy, uncompromised by sin. Yesterday, I came across a little write-up about, um, oh, what's his name now, the, the, the basketball star of Cleveland. What's his name? Tell me. James. I didn't know that James was, you know, came from such humble background. But he learned through sports to discipline his mind. He married his high school sweetheart. One of the significant things that was pointed in that little write-up is that all these years, he has not had any character crisis, unlike many other athletes. 
He has made himself available to his children all times, at all times. He has continued to love his wife. I was impressed. Jesus was uncompromised in every way by sin. As Hebrews 7, 20, 26 tells us, Jesus was dedicated to God. The high priest had to be dedicated to God as we find in Leviticus 21, verse 12, as Jesus was in Luke chapter 2. He was to be, anointed, he was to be the anointed one. The high priest had to be anointed with oil, Leviticus 1, 21, 12, as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. He is the anointed one, the Christ. If we are reminded of the need for a perfect priest in chapter 21 of Leviticus, we are also reminded of the need for a perfect sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 22. The sacrifice has to be without defect. It had to be, it had to be completely unblemished. Jesus was both perfect priest and perfect sacrifice. Take these passages together and meditate on the extraordinary soul cry. Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians chapter, chapter 2, 11. And on his wonderful love for us, demonstrated by his crucifixion on our behalf. And our appropriate response is to love the Lord. I want to, I want to uh, bring this short thinking meditation to a close as I take you to a song. I am a Methodist by, by heritage. Um, let me see. I know he's here. And can it be? How many of you have heard of that song? And can it be? Let me try again. It's not this one. I don't know how many of you, I'm sure that many of you have heard of the Wesley boys, Charles and John Wesley. Charles was the songwriter. John was the preacher. By this time that I want to tell you, this was 1838. 18, uh, uh, Charles was vast in the scriptures. He knew his scriptures. He had gone to Oxford. He had learned everything about the scriptures. He knew, he knew about the ministry. But one thing he didn't know, he didn't know Jesus personally. He had no assurance of his soul going to meet his Savior. So on the night of the 20, May 20th, Charles had an encounter, an extraordinary encounter with the Lord, where he came face to face with the claims of Christ. And the following day, he pinned down, out of the wealth of the scriptures that he has known, he pinned down this song, and can it be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior? i just like to read the stanzas so that you see. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. Tis mercy all, let earth adore. Let angels' minds inquire no more. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. 
emptied himself all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free. For, oh my God, he found out me. Long my imprisoned soul lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eyes diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I arose, went forth, and followed thee. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ, my own. This morning, I don't know where you are. You may be a Charles Wesley, and Trinity is known to be scripturally strong, scripturally based church, and many know the scripture. But do you know the author of the scriptures? He was crucified for me. Many times, like I contemplate this morning, my Lord, my friend, my Messiah was crucified. I joined the saints of old and said, were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And do you know him? Sister Gomes, would you play? I want you to join me as we sing the invitation song. And I have done it already. And uh, I congratulate myself for this short message. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.